Okay, you know a scenario is gonna be good when you have this many dream handouts. I mean, come on, that's pretty cool. I'm going to be reviewing Cat's Cradle, which was published by Ruined Relic Games. And this scenario is sandbox and takes about six to eight hours. So my players and I power through in one session, but you'll likely break it up into two. This scenario is a sequel to the very popular and free Chaosium scenario, The Haunting, that is available in the Quick Start rules, so I'll link that in the description below. And you can either play Cat's Cradle as a direct sequel to The Haunting, or you can play it just as a standalone. So there's flexibility there, which makes this scenario pretty cool. There's a pretty basic setup. Your investigators receive a letter from Stephen Knott, who is claiming to help them with their recent nightmares. So there's two different versions of this letter, depending on if you're playing it as a sequel or if you're playing it standalone, which is really cool and helpful. And basically, you're going to meet at a diner and hear what Stephen Knott has to say. Now, from here on out, there are going to be spoilers. So if you don't want those, go ahead and watch some of my other videos and send your keepers my way. Before we get into the meat of the content, I have to address some keeper prep elements. The first is, can this really be played as a standalone? And the answer is very much yes. So I had a mix of different players at my table. A few of them had played The Haunting, and I had played The Haunting, but it had been 10 years. <laughs> so I didn't have a great memory of everything that went in into The Haunting, and we certainly didn't have the investigators that would carry over from those original plays. So we opted to play it more as a standalone, and it was more of just those fun Easter eggs that we did end up picking up if any of my players had previously played it. And this worked really well. So there are a lot of different options for different handouts depending on if you had played it before or not. And there's cool connection points if you did end up playing The Haunting that you'll be able to pick up on and just add a little bit more flavor to the scenario. But the overall answer is yes, this can be played as standalone. The next question you might have is, did this actually work as a sandbox scenario or was it more linear? And the answer is it was definitely sandbox. My players did not go in the order in the scenario and everything worked out really well. There's a lot of options to change locations of clues and a lot of places where you can help get your players back on track if necessary. So yes, this was a sandbox scenario. Now, if you are playing this as a sequel, you can often move the investigators from the haunting straight into Cat's Cradle. But if that's not the case, you might want to start with some new investigators. And this scenario did not come with pregens. I generally like having pregens just because my group for one shots likes to get up and going pretty quickly. So we don't want to spend a ton of time making characters. So that is a downside if you generally like pregens. That being said, if you are playing this as a standalone, you can always take the pregens from The Haunting, which is what we ended up doing, and just using them for Cat's Cradle. The other element to talk about for investigators is the scenario does a good bit of time talking about the importance of character backstory and methods to do that, which by the way, if you're interested, I have a video all about character backstory if you want to check that out. But for this certain scenario, I didn't think the emphasis was entirely necessary on character backstory. It's more of just additional flavor if you want it, but don't stress about having a lot of this for your investigators if you just want to get up and go and play. It is not essential to gameplay. What I ended up doing for my players was just had them take the pregens that we played with and come up with one traumatic event from their past so I could pull from that if necessary. It was also helpful because that is what I used to curate the different dreams that my players started out with. So not everything had a match, but for example, someone had something traumatic relating to fire and there was a nightmare handout that had fire in it, so I was able to assign that specific one to them. So this can be used in a variety of ways at the beginning, but also throughout the scenario if there's places that you can call on specific visions or specific dreams that they're having that would relate to a trauma or backstory, that could be really cool. 
but again this is not necessary for the scenario. The final keeper prep element I want to talk about is handouts. So this was a little bit clunky and that's because we actually used some of the handouts from The Haunting and some of the handouts from Cat's Cradle. So when I was playing it was a little bit juggling all the different handouts and figuring out oh number seven but which number seven is it which it is marked in the scenario, but it's just an extra layer of time and thinking and managing the handouts. So be aware of that. And then there was a couple of the handouts that the cursive was a little bit tough to read. So make sure that you read through it beforehand and get the gist of what's going on. Okay, so what is going on here? We have Pastor Michael Thomas, who was a pastor of the Church of Contemplation. Now, he was a mentor to Walter Corbett, who's the focus of The Haunting. And Michael Thomas was working on immortality and did various different experiments to try and figure this out. But the relevant one for the scenario is what happened in 1912. At the Church of Contemplation, Michael Thomas and his cultists were putting on a ritual for seven of the cultists that volunteered to transfer minds with children's bodies. Unfortunately for the cultists, the police caught on to these disappearances and there was a raid at the church at the time this ritual was going on. So there was a ton of chaos, but the ritual had already started and the swap had taken place. So now we have the police coming in with kids that have these adult cultist minds in them and then the adult bodies that have the kids who are freaking out and scared minds in them. So Pastor Thomas is ended up arrested and then the adult bodies are taken to a mental institution because these kids are just not able to conceptualize what is happening so they're just not in a very healthy mental state. And then the children, which have the cultist minds in them, are taken back to their families. But you'll learn that soon after they were returned to the families, all of these cultists have had run away from them. So they're off living their lives and trying to stay under the radar to make sure that they can figure out a way to get out of these kids' bodies. Because you'll also learn that something in the witch world didn't quite go right and these children's bodies will not age. So going to the time frame that it is right now, which is 1921, these children's bodies have not aged in that entire time and they're still trying to figure out a way to reverse or correct this ritual. And that's where your investigators come in because they need a very important artifact, which is a globe. And this globe will help initiate some sort of transfer or correction of the ritual. A key for tip for everyone, this can actually get pretty confusing about adult brains and children bodies and the opposite. So my tip for you is to create a list of names and label them child and adult and match them up so you know whose body has whose mind in it in case your players get to this situation and they want to try and figure it out. So where do all these dreams and nightmares come in that really pulls the investigators in in the first place? Well, Michael Thomas actually escaped from prison and now he's looking to try and get some help to find this globe. And he thinks these investigators are well equipped to do so. So he actually lures them in with a letter that is not from Stephen Knott. Stephen Knott died a couple weeks ago from a heart attack, but it's a way to lure them in and start getting them investigating and interested in finding what's going on. And it works quite well. <laughs> Don't forget to begin your session with your players taking sanity from their assigned nightmares. And a warning that this scenario is pretty heavy with sanity loss. I actually had a player that went indefinitely insane and it was a ton of fun, um, but just be aware that's definitely a risk for your players that there's gonna be quite a bit of sanity loss in this scenario. Since this is a beefier scenario, I'm just going to be hitting the major locations and then tips for overall gameplay. And a reminder, your players will not need to go in the specific order that I have listed. 
The first one I want to talk about is Clarion Used Books. This is a bookstore where we have Edwin, who is a child body in cultist mind, that is running the bookstore. Now, of course, he puts on an act that his parents are gonna be back soon, and he's just watching the shop until that time. But depending on where your investigators are at this point, they will either know that that's definitely not the truth, or they'll be able to figure it out with a psychology role. Now, this is the location in which my slowly going insane investigator ended up stealing a bit of Edwin's hair to be able to do a spell that he had previously learned. Now this spell is something that your players may or may not end up learning, but it just so happened he learned Tenembrous Sight, and this was an ability for him to see the last 24 hours of anyone who he had a specific piece of DNA or something important to them that he could make the spell around. Now, if your players do end up learning this spell, make sure you're really careful about the amount of details that you're giving. So it comes in visions. It's not a very concrete, this is the exact 24 hours and you can watch all of it. It's just here and there, little flashes. You're not gonna be able to get all of the conversations that happen, but it's a good way to reward your players for learning this and taking the sanity hit for learning this and give them a few clues and directions on where to go. Now, of course, the cool and interesting part about having these children is that to the general public, they look like children. So when my character went to pull the hair out of Edwin, he immediately freaked out, ran to the street, and started screaming for help. So my investigators were put in a little bit of an awkward situation, having to escape out the back and pull the slowly going insane person through the back door to escape. So just keep in mind there's always an out if your investigators start to do something a little bit weird. Remember that the general public definitely still thinks these are children. The Chapel of Contemplation are actually ruins from back 1912 when all of this happened. And this is the place where your players have the potential to learn this spell. So through a series of pretty lucky Latin rolls, they were able to learn it, at least one of my investigators was. So just be aware again of how much information you're giving during these visions. And a tip if they ask to see or figure out having a position from Michael Thomas, you can always tell them that there was dirt around in the vision because Michael Thomas's original body was buried in the dirt. So that's just an option if they're pretty close to the beginning of the scenario and you don't want to give too much away just yet. So I ended up doing that which forced them to go down a route of uh, hunting down these children cultists and getting something more personal from them. A general tip about the library and police station, this is a great place to move clues around or get your players back on track if needed. And stick around for the story of how my player ended up in police custody. Real quick, I just wanna point out the amazing artwork behind me. This was done by Matt Stricker, also known as Reaching for Divine. So I'm gonna link his work in the description below. Please check it out and support him if you're able because this art I think is so incredibly cool. The next location is the Richter residence. So this is a retired cop who was actually in charge of the raid that happened on the Chapel of Contemplation. So he's gonna know all the details from that day. It's really cool to be able to fill the gap in for your players if they're not quite sure of the whole story up until this point. Now the most important thing about this residence is that is where the original artifact globe is located. So if your players are looking for that and trying to get possession of it, that's where they're going to want to go. Seeing Richter starts a ticking time clock for the scenario. So the cultists are obviously watching the investigators. So if they see that they've made their way to the place with the globe, now they know the location and they're gonna be going in after it themselves. So in addition to having the conflict between the cultist timeline and your investigators, this is also going to trigger more severe nightmares and really uh, amp up the horror and the personal horror if you're digging into that character backstory at this point. Now, my players, since this is very sandbox, did not go to the Richter Resonance until very, very late in the scenario. They actually thought that the globe in the Brown Residence, which is one of the cultists in children's bodies that went missing, they thought that that 
fake decoy globe was the real thing, and that led to some issues with Mary Claire later in the scenario. So just be aware that you may or may not trigger this elevated nightmare scenario, but it is an option if you visit a little bit earlier or mid in the scenario. Very importantly, I do want to mention that it said the globe is very fragile. So I actually think this is a pretty big flaw because there is a tendency among groups if they find something important or if they think it's evil that they're just going to immediately try to destroy it. So a real little bit of a workaround here is that the globe is pretty hard to destroy when it's not being used in the ritual. If you're actively using it for the ritual, that's when it starts to become more vulnerable and you could give your players an option at that point to destroy it. But I would say it kind of cuts off a lot of the scenario if you give them the option to immediately destroy it. And just work with that and see if the different version of how fragile it is will work with your group. Next is the State Lunatic Hospital, and this location was really, really fun. So this is where you'll likely be meeting Mary Claire, who is a cultist in a child body, who is wanting to reverse this ritual or at least jump to another body. Now, she will likely try to convince the investigators that she's the only good one of the cultists, and she's just trying to make things right again but she doesn't want to involve anyone else because they're evil and they have plans for mortality. And so it's only her that they should be really allying themselves with. Now she has a pretty good case. She's just trying to get back into her original body, which we later find out is not an option, but she lies to them and convinces them that that's what they need to do. So my players went down the path of allying with Mary Claire, kidnapping her adult body, and doing the ritual. So stay tuned to see what happened there. But overall, the investigators were able to ally with Mary Claire and someone was on the inside of the mental institute. So going back to my player who got indefinitely insane, he did a spell and it made him go a little crazy. He ended up visiting a school to try and find these children. And the secretary noticed he was a little bit strange because he just kept drawing different children and pointing to them and it was quite interesting. But this ended him going to police custody and the police said he needed to go for a mental evaluation, linking them back to this institute, which they previously hadn't had a ton of clues to go to. So we had an inside man now at the mental institute who voluntarily checked himself in. Again, very important to give your players a little bit of agency. So uh, I made it a choice whether he was able to get checked in or if he wanted to uh, go ahead and have a clear evaluation. But he chose to check himself in, which was very interesting. And then in addition to getting a disguised investigator into the Institute, they were able to get some fire alarms going. Which, by the way, we had to pause and figure out what fire alarms were like in the 1920s. So keep me honest here, we ended up ruling that it would end up either flashing or making some sort of noise. But we also know that during that time, it was common for the fire alarms to just send a signal to the local fire branch and then they would bring the necessary people to try and put that fire out. So we weren't totally clear which one it is. If you do know, please let me know in the comments because it would be cool to really understand if we played that right. But either way, there was a, a commotion and they were able to gather the adult body and go then travel to Grape Island, which is the real headquarters of these cultists. Now we get to Grape Island, which is a really, really cool setting with all these really beautiful purple flowers but you have to be careful because there's some abominations roaming because there were failed experiments from this immortality thing. I loved all the different options that were available so you could figure out what your investigators had done up until this point and then align with how the cultists were going to react. Now, Mary Claire was at that time allied with them, so she just led them safely, somewhat safely. They did encounter a, an abomination and they had to run away from it, but no harm there. They were able to escape and go and do the ritual. 
Now this ritual ended with Mary Claire switching brains with one of my investigators and that made for a really solid fun ending to a scenario with lots of investigation and lots of different options and paths to go down. So going into my overall thoughts, I really liked that the scenario was reminiscent of some of the older Call of Cthulhu scenarios in the way that it was written and the different Call of Cthulhu handouts. And then also the different endings that you could go to was really clear and helpful for the keeper as well as having this sandbox option which worked really well because there's a lot of different duplication of where you could have clues and ways that you could get your players back on track. I hope you liked my review of Cat's Cradle. If you're interested in checking out, I will have the link in the description. And a reminder that I do provide developmental editing for Call of Cthulhu scenarios. My website will be in the description as well if you're interested in working with me. Thank you so much for watching. Bye.